Mountain Rescue is a 24-hour day, seven days a week, 365 days a year voluntary service that saves lives in the most remote and adverse terrain. The Mountain Rescue Association, known as the MRA, was established in 1959, making them the oldest search and rescue association in North America. Today, the MRA consists of 100 teams across eight regions of the U.S. and Canada, representing over 3,000 volunteer rescue mountaineers. We work to improve the quality, availability, and safety of mountain search and rescue. The Mountain Rescue Association has grown to become the premier mountain search and rescue resource in North America. The MRA provides scenario-based, peer accreditation for rescue teams in mountain-specific rescue disciplines. Each team trains rigorously to national guidelines, practicing a variety of rescue scenarios to better prepare them for their next emergency. MRA teams perform over 5,000 search and rescue operations in North America each year. When needed, our teams work with local, regional, and federal agencies, as well as state and provisional authorities and medical professionals to assist those in need and help save lives. Whether it's a hiker that stumbles, a climber that falls, or a child that wanders away from their family, Mountain Rescue Association teams are always there to help. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, our professional volunteers dedicate themselves to saving lives through rescue and mountain safety education. Operations, scope operations, team one, heading into the field. Mountain Rescue Association. Courage, commitment, compassion. Hey everybody, welcome. It's good to have you here for the premiere evening of the MRA's online third Thursday training program. I'm, my name is Charlie Shemansky, and I'm the education director for the MRA. I'm also the Mountain Rescue Program Coordinator for Flight for Life in Colorado and the Air Rescue Commission President for the International Commission for Alpine Rescue. It's good to have you here. Um, we have at least 100 participants uh, tonight and hoping to have more coming in through the, through the program. Um, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to share with you a quick PowerPoint uh, that will walk you through a little bit of what tonight's going to be all about. Uh, this is our premiere evening, as I, as I mentioned to you, and um, I uh, want to first off thank some really important people, Michael St. John. Uh, I'll cut to Michael in just a moment. Um, he is the guy who came up with this concept. Ella Fosca, thank you, Ella, for all your work. From Marin County, SAR also, uh, who's given us some marketing support. Gary Ferris is our MRA webmaster, and Don Wilson uh, from MRA Sponsorships, who you'll hear from uh, just in a quick moment. I wouldn't do my job if I didn't do a shameless plug for our education base camp, MRA education base camp. We have so far 4,700 enrollees worldwide with certificate courses, as you can see, they're listed. If you're not already enrolled, it just requires an email address, no cost to uh, anybody. Uh, you can see how to get into it, MRA, sorry, training.mra.org. I want to just also add that um, uh, uh, I'm going to start with these quick introductions and then I'm going to turn it over to Michael St. John uh, to sort of describe his uh, sort of concept when we did this. Um, Doug McCall, president of MRA, is going to make a few comments. We're excited to have Petzl as our sponsor tonight and Steve Petty, the Western sales manager for uh, Petzl, is going to give us an update. And then pretty quickly, we'll, we'll go to Dr. Christopher Van Tilburg. Um, who's going to do our keynote presentation uh, for the evening. Let me also advise you that third Thursday in December, January, and February is already booked. In fact, March is also booked. We've got a hypothermia talk uh, scheduled for December, a uh, SAR topo program in January, and then summer, uh, spring and summer avalanches with Dale Atkins in February. So we're really going to encourage you to stay tuned with all of us. Um, 
And with that, I'm going to stop share our screen for just a quick moment, and I want to introduce Michael St. John. Uh, Michael is the uh, reason we're all here tonight. He's the guy who came up with this concept, knowing that trainings are pretty limited with our SAR teams, particularly in-person trainings, and I want to give him a chance to say hello and, and to introduce uh, himself in this program. Michael joined the Marin County Search and Rescue Team in 1979 as an explorer scout. Um, and currently serves as the team leader for Marin County Sheriff's Search and Rescue. Recently retired after a long and distinguished career uh, as battalion chief at the Mill Valley uh, Fire Department after 33 years. Currently serves as a Type 3 incident uh, management team member as a California OES instructor and NASAR managing lost person uh, incident instructor. And Michael is also an at-large member of the MRA board. Uh, so Michael, jump in and um, give us a few words, if you will. Good evening. Uh, I'm uh, the new member at large. And uh, one of the things Doug McCall tapped me to do was to reach out um, and, and work on internal marketing. Uh, a lot of us have been shut in due to COVID. Um, it's greatly impacted uh, training uh, across pretty much all mountain rescue teams and uh, canceled our conference. So we wanted to find a way that we could reach out to the membership and provide some excellent quality training. Uh, Doug was also a big part of uh, um, uh, visioning this and Charlie Shemansky has done an amazing job of pulling it all together through training and education and making this happen. Um, so I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. Uh, Charlie uh, uh, Van Tilburg on tonight and uh, looking forward to the presentation and I'm gonna I'm going to stop there. Thanks all for being here tonight. Oh, and I want to introduce Doug McCall, president of the Mountain Rescue Association. Uh, thank you, Michael. And I want to, first, I want to thank uh, Charlie Shemansky, uh, Michael, and uh, Christopher Van Tilburg for all your hard work in pulling this together uh, in, in such a short amount of time. Uh, also, I want to thank you to Petzl for being our name sponsor tonight. And last and certainly not least, uh, thank you to each of you for attending this evening. Uh, I've been getting some comments. It looks like we uh, have a 100 participant limit and we're trying to resolve that. We did uh, upgrade our license so we, to 500 limit, so we're, we're uh, looking into that. Uh, but these are the things that sometimes happen uh, when we first launched things. So I uh, appreciate the patience as we get work through this. Uh, second, uh, you know, we just want to say that your MRA officers, your committee chairs, and your committee members have been working hard to drive value of the MRA back to the individual rescuer beyond the uh, professional rescue association that the MRA already offer, offers. Uh, this program is one of those where we are working to continue to demonstrate the MRA's leadership in the field of rescue. And then finally, you know, this, this pandemic has been hard. I'm proud of each of you for meeting these challenges, supporting your teammates, and adapting to the scenarios that we have before us. Uh, while we adapt to scenarios every day in mountain rescue, it, it's kind of what we do. Uh, remember to take care of yourself, assess where you are on the stress, the stress continuum. If you aren't familiar with that, you can take the resiliency training on the MRA.org website on Basecamp, and uh, that can help you know, if, if you find yourself uh, struggling, and it's always good, good to know where you are. And finally, you are the MRA. Uh, I am proud and humbled by the great work that you do each and every day. And I want to thank you for your continued commitment and work uh, in the mountain rescue on your mountain rescue team. And with that, I turn it over to Charlie to introduce, I think, uh, Petzl, uh, Steve. Thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks also for your leadership. I want to reiterate one thing that Doug, Doug mentioned. Um, we do have uh, a 500 uh, participants uh, license with Zoom, but for some reason it cut us off at 100. If you have fellow rescue team members that wanted to dial in tonight, 
uh, rest assured we are recording this um, and uh, we're going to make it available to everybody uh, online just as soon as I can turn over the recording. Also, I want to ask you that during the presentation, if you have any questions of, um, uh, of uh, Dr. Van Tilburg, uh, ask them through the chat and I'll be monitoring chat and I'll try to uh, ask Dr. Van Tilburg your questions at the end. But with only under participants, we might be able to open up the floor uh, to, uh, uh, to, to any of you that may ask questions. Now with that, let me uh, introduce our, our sponsor. We're really grateful to all of our MRA sponsors um, and we'll highlight one of them on every one of our third Thursdays. Our sponsor for tonight is Petzl, a name known to every one of you, I'm sure. Um, and I, uh, Steve Petty, who I'm about to introduce, will, will share a little bit about uh, a giveaway at the end of the night. So stay on the line with us. Um, because there will be a giveaway. Don Wilson, who represents the MRA in our sponsorship program um, and a real shining star with MRA, will be giving away, away I think, a Petzl Maestro. Steve's going to tell us more about that. I'm really honored to be able to introduce my friend, Steve Petty, who's Western Sales Manager for Petzl. Uh, I've been a regular user of Petzl products at the risk of sounding like a suck up. Uh, from hanging under helicopters and their harnesses to their specialized helmets that accommodate my Petzl, Petzl I'm sorry, Peltor helicopter rescue headset. Steve has over 20 years of volunteer work as a mountain rescue specialist, medic, sheriff's deputy, and a SWAT officer, as well as a firefighter. Uh, he's also an adventure racer. He's participated in events that were over 150 miles in length and 36,000 feet in elevation gain. I'm exhausted just hearing about that. Um, Steve's passion for helping others combined with his training in rope access, um, tower climbing and tactical operations make him super strong at his job representing Petzl. You've all probably met Steve at MRA meetings, both winter business meetings and spring meetings. Um, Steve Petty, Steve, jump in. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> what do I say? Uh, I, I am very honored to be here. Uh, we're honored to be a sponsor of the MRA. And I'm tickled with the opportunity I have to work as kind of a go-between between Petzl and the MRA to help with product development and uh, best practice development. And uh, I just wanted to show a, a quick video and then I'm going to show, well, first I, I have to show the prize. Uh, Don's going to give away a, a maestro uh, by the end of uh, tonight's program, so stay online. Uh, I'm gonna show uh, a video and then a resource that's uh, made just for uh, uh, rescue uh, community. I'm Steve Petty with the Davis County Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team. I'm a 17 year member of Search and Rescue and we do rescue operations in the Wasatch Mountains of Utah. The Maestro represents a big step forward in technology for creating a device that makes hull systems more efficient and intuitive to operate. Whether I'm working as a litter attendant, operating a belay, or directing the entire rescue operation, I know I can trust the Maestro as a key component of our rescue systems. Ça fonctionne sur un descendeur classique hein, de type rig, puisqu'il y a une poignée pour pouvoir descendre, une poulie et un bloqueur intégré avec l'anti-retour. On doit avoir toute confiance dans son matériel. Depuis des années, on travaille avec du matériel Petzel et il y a une confiance qui s'est créée. La clé du réussite du secours, c'est la confiance en ses équipiers et en son matériel. Le Maestro, c'est une véritable révolution. On peut hisser une charge, on peut assurer, on peut descendre. Avec quelques grammes, on peut tout faire. The simplicity and reliability of the Maestro also minimize the number of personnel needed to conduct high angle rescue operations. Because you need fewer people to operate the system, you can put more focus on patient. I just wanted to uh, just briefly direct your attention to uh, uh, 
a website that we've created for the rescue community called uh, Petzl Rescue Solutions. Uh, and let's see if I can uh, quick show that. Uh, I got that. PetzlRescueSolutions.com. And sorry about the. Uh, oh, that's not the right one. Let me just stop sharing right there. Uh, Petzl Rescue Solutions, it's a, it's a website that uh, gives you product information and uh, a lot of different resources, and uh, uh, including tech tips. A lot of people aren't aware of the tech tips that we have. These are how-to videos and, and links that, uh, that are organized by product and by activity and really help uh, users get more out of our products so that you can uh, uh, interpret more from the diagrams and, and know uh, more uh, things that you can do with these products and best practices. So with that, I'll turn the time back over to Charlie and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve, and I uh, really appreciate Petzl, one of the longest standing uh, uh, partners that we've had uh, in the MRA and appreciate you in particular with your long history in search and rescue. Um, and uh, I also should give a shout out to my daughter who's uh, sort of co-host tonight. She just posted the uh, Petzl link in the chat. So if you're looking to uh, get that Petzl, uh, that website that Steve mentioned, um, you'll see it in the chat. So with that, it's, uh, it's my privilege to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for the night, Dr. Christopher Van Tilburg, who's no stranger to any of us in the mountain rescue community. Uh, Dr. Van Tilburg has a long history in SAR at a local level, at a national level, international level. Um, he is a two decade veteran of Craig Rats in Hood River, Oregon, one of the first uh, teams uh, at, the, uh, at the genesis of the MRA, also a member of Portland Mountain Rescue, but within the MRA community, he's well known as our chair of the MRA Medical Committee, and he's a regional PIO for MRA, um, and also the, a medical delegate to the Medical Commission of the International Commission for Alpine Rescue and represents the MRA very well. He also works as an emergency occupational travel and ski resort physician. I like the ski resort physician part the best. Um, it's fitting that our first third Thursday covers the topic of COVID-19 um, and even more fitting that our first presenter is such an esteemed rescue mountaineer and emergency physician at a time when the COVID numbers are going off the charts. Teams like mine are cutting back now on our in-person training and having to go back to a mode of a lot of virtual trainings, which was the genesis of this program. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Stay Safe COVID Risk and Prevention for Rescue Mountaineers, it's a privilege to introduce Dr. Christopher Van Tilburg. Christopher, the virtual floor is yours, my friend. Well, thanks, thanks for that introduction, uh, Charlie and uh, uh, I, I feel really honored to be here and be able to speak tonight. Um, the one thing Charlie didn't mention about my jobs is uh, a couple, about three years ago, I took a very part-time job in our county. Uh, Hood River County has 30,000 people, pretty small in Oregon. I took a very part-time job as a public health officer, and uh, that obviously has exploded. So I've been, you know, every day it's COVID. Um, so uh, I, I've I've put together a program. I think it's going to be about 30 minutes. I've structured it mostly uh, in three pieces um, before you go on a mission, during a mission, after a mission. I'm going to deviate from some of the things that you might see on the CDC website because I think we have a very unique and specialized uh, job that we're operating in austere conditions, and uh, that makes everything challenging, including uh, managing COVID. And so, uh, is my screen coming through okay? Yeah, Christopher, you're loud and clear, thanks. But uh, did I share my screen or not yet? Uh, negative. Okay, let me share my screen and we'll, um, uh, we'll get going here. Yeah, you're good. Okay. How's that? Yep, Okay. good. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of move fast. Some of this might be review, some of it, um, uh, is I'm going to gloss over. I'm going to do a quick overview. So COVID, we consider 
droplet and aerosolized transmission mostly. So droplet we think of as people coughing and sneezing and you're spewing heavier wet droplets that you know spray on people directly. Aerosolized we think of breathing in proximity of somebody infected is how an aerosolized uh, drier smaller particle floats around. That's like being in the elevator with somebody. They're not coughing, they're not sneezing, but they're breathing and um, that's potentially uh, mixing their expired breath with uh, yours. So we, we're not really sure about contact um, with hard surfaces. We think it's not a much of a common way that COVID is transmitted. The main way it's transmitted through uh, hard surfaces would be if somebody coughs or sneezes on their hands, touches a steering wheel, a carabiner, something, passes it onto their a colleague, and then that person gets COVID on their hands and touches their face, which is why washing hands and wearing a mask you know, minimizes, if not eliminates, contact um, transmission. Um, so we're, we don't, uh, we're out, being outdoors is very low risk to begin with. You know, we're spread out, we're outside, the sky's um, uh, open, and so we, we think it's very low risk, or certainly it's low risk being outside. Like I said, we're not sure about surfaces, so the surfaces of your, you know, equipment, probably very low risk. We know that animals carry uh, a variety of different coronaviruses, and animals have had SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So we're, we're really not exactly sure yet about um, animals. So uh, you've seen this before. These are the four pillars of safety. Wear a mask, physical separation, wash hands, and stay home when you're ill. I mean, these are, these are a little bit tough for us to follow as rescue mountaineers. And probably the fourth one is really hard to do, even if you have a little sniffle or a really tiny headache or just a mild upset stomach. I mean, th those are indications to stay home and that's really hard to do when we're hanging out at home and we get the page and we are available to go. And so those are, those are really the four um, primary modes of protecting ourselves. We think of, we call this, uh, this other piece the three C's of transmission. So these are closed spaces with poor ventilation. So that'd be like a SAR vehicle or shelter if you're in a bivouac. Uh, crowded places. So that might be search base, um, indoor training can be crowded uh, or in a command vehicle. And then the third piece is close contact. And so that would be when you're with your colleagues uh, on a mission. So here's the, these are pre-COVID pictures. This is a mission with Portland Mountain Rescue and Craig Rats in a snowcat. So that would be a you know closed space. Um, this would be a crowded area. This is a I think this is one of the few rescues, or this is actually a body recovery from a couple of years ago. One of the few that we've had, which all five Oregon Mountain Rescue teams participated on. But you can see there's a lot of people there. This is pre-COVID. This is a command vehicle. So and here's a um, this is a mission on the uh, south side of Mount Hood at the fumarole. And so these are all uh, risks that are really tough for us to mitigate as, uh, as rescuers in the field. Here's another, this mission was uh, November 1st of this year. So just three weeks ago, this is a body recovery on the south side, or sorry, the north side of Mount Hood up on the glacier. Very uh, complex, technical, dangerous mission with Craig Rats and Portland Mountain Rescue. And you can see it's it's difficult to maintain physical distancing and when you're operating in these conditions. And so uh, we we have to try if we can and do the best we can, but it's it's very difficult. And the main thing is probably to be aware when we have to kind of break from COVID precautions. I'm gonna talk about that in the middle, in a minute. So before you go, so probably all of you by now, we're 10 months deep in the pandemic, you probably already have this stuff uh, in your ready pack. So one trick that I learned years ago from working at the ski resort is um, extra, extra large, double thick nitrile gloves, and I can put those over top of my work gloves. So if you have to uh, interact with a patient, especially if there's body fluid contaminants, you can keep your warm work gloves on and still have the nitrile gloves on and then peel them off and not take off your work gloves. So that's one trick. Another trick is uh, I carry these Paws, which is just a brand for a alcohol um, wipe. And so carry those in your rescue pack, uh, you know, half dozen of them. So if you stop 
for a break and get some food, you can clean your hands. Or if you do have a contamination, like we had this body recovery three weeks ago on the mountain, and you know there's some body fluids that sometimes you brush up against somebody with your elbow or your arm, even if you're wearing gloves, you can wipe it off really quickly. So very handy to have. Um, I want to mention about masks because this question comes up uh, all the time. And so generally, we're not recommending face coverings as a protective barrier. So in a pinch, a buff might work, or as a backup, certainly a buff is a good, you know, we're all carrying buffs in the mountains anyway. But generally you want a three layer cloth mask. The standard is a procedure mask, also called a surgical mask, also called a, um, a type two mask. But the problem with those masks is they're paper and they're just not very durable if you're in the wind and the snow and the rain. And so a cloth, three layer cloth mask is, um, is adequate. Um, in, there's a lot of people that have KN95s. If you don't know what a KN95 is, it's basically an N95 that hasn't been approved either because of the materials or more likely just hasn't been tested and approved in the United States or in North America as an N95. So a KN95 and an N95, the, the 95 signifies it filters 95% uh, of particulate matter, down to, I think, four microns. And so, in general, we are, have been telling people that KN95 is equivalent to a procedure mask, but in actuality, it's much better than a procedure mask. And you can see this one here on the, on the picture. It has two straps. It fits tighter. It's a little more, it's thicker. So if you have one, it's probably a good idea. Um, we don't want you to use a valve unless you cover it, because the valves are really designed for somebody who's wearing a mask, like they're shaping a surfboard and there's foam going all over the room and they are, it's hot and they perspire and they want to ex expel their expired breath through the valve so they don't build up a lot of moisture in their mask. But that doesn't really work to keep your buddy safe from COVID or your colleagues. So, um, so try to avoid um, the valve. Now the K, the, the N95, in order for it to work properly, it has to be fitted. So it's, it's hard to get these fitted. It's hard to find some place. My, my clinic in Hood River had to get the um, fit kit and train a nurse. And she went around and train and fit all the fire department, volunteer fire departments uh, for an N95. So it has to be fit, tested to see if it works um, for your face and there's different brands. And if you're fit tested on one brand, that doesn't mean you're fit tested on another brand. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then finally, if you're using a half mask respirator, these work great, except they also have an exhaust valve that needs to be covered. And they typically, they come in an N, a N95 or a P95 or a P100. So the 100 filters 100% 100 of particulate matter. The P means it's uh, resistant to oil as opposed to the N, which you know we use in the medical uh, in the hot medical situations, which you don't really need it resistant to oil. Okay, so that's masks. So mask questions. Uh, number one, is a buff okay? Not as your primary mask. Should I wear a mask in the truck? Yes. You know, we've been wearing, uh, my team has been wearing masks as we drive to the rescue, um, going up the mountain in the truck. I went skiing today with some buddies, uh, and all three of us wore masks for the 40-minute drive to the mountain. So wear a mask in the truck. Do you need to wear a mask on the approach trail uphill ski? No, as long as you can spread out. So, um, you, you know, if you've got an hour long ski or two hour long hike up the trail, just spread out and you don't need to wear a mask. Do you need an N95? You don't need one if you, unless you're gonna interact in a medical capacity with somebody who has active respiratory symptoms. So if you've got a couple for your team, it's good to have it in your cash or your truck. If you, um, but you don't, every, not everybody needs these. These are still in short supply um, in uh, North America. This came up, this last question came up for us early in the pandemic. It probably won't come up for anybody now, hopefully, but this came up for us early in the pandemic. We were on a mission with another agency, not a mountain rescue team or a SAR team. And the other team wasn't wearing um, masks the way we were. And that can be, you know, that's, it's really tough to bring that topic up. So that's probably something to immediately bring up for the team leader and immediately for uh, your, you know, team's medical director or your team's president or one of your team's, um, you know, designated leaders to discuss that with the other team, which is what we did. But that's, that's, a, that's an issue that hopefully uh, won't come up, but it, it may. Uh, it may come up. 
Um, so that's, that's sort of um, before you go. I want to talk a little bit about what we do when we're on missions to protect ourselves from COVID. Um, so when you arrive at Starbase, uh, hopefully you're spaced out either in your private vehicle or you're like us, we have uh, max four, four people in our trucks. So we've got this Ford F-250 and so we just seat the outboard positions only. Um, it's not perfect, but it saves um, bringing more vehicles into places where we may not be able to bring more vehicles. Um, if you do your Sargar, um, it's good to address COVID. Now, early on in the pandemic, we were doing these, uh, you know, fairly detailed, and it might be now that we're deep into the pandemic, it might be just a brief mention, but I think it's worth doing it separate from your normal Sargar, just to do a check. Everybody's got a mask, a few people at least have hand sanitizer, um, we're going to space out on the trail, just do that check before you leave. Um, we haven't been, um, we haven't been success, largely successful at, um, at appointing a COVID cop. You know, it's not a bad idea to have a COVID safety officer, somebody to keep track of people. Probably really good idea for, especially during trainings um, or at search base. But um, we, we have had to do that a few times where we had to make sure we get people, um, uh, um, you know, remind people of COVID precautions. Um, I didn't, I, I breezed over this in my earlier slide and eyewear, eyewear is important to protect COVID. So you can, you know, everybody's probably got goggles in their winter pack, maybe in their summer pack, if you operate with helicopters or sunglasses, a great option if you wear reading glasses like me, you can just buy some clear um, work safety glasses that have bifocals in them. And it's like, I got, you know, six for $15 or something and you wear them for a couple missions and they get trashed. But eyewear is important if you're interacting with patients or uh, subjects or other people. And so bring a mask and some eyewear for your subject. Um, a lot of people, at least the rescues I think that we've been on uh, for hikers, they are already have a mask with them, but I would, uh, you know, don't take that chance. Bring one for the patient. It's a great idea to take the face shield for your litter, even if you're not in terrain that you feel like you need it for rockfall. So down here, you know, we all have litters with face shields uh, because that's just an extra barrier. It's a great barrier. So bring your face shield every time. Um, and then, um, you know, minimize touching your mask. And that's a personal thing. And that's really hard to do because, you know, it's windy or it's raining or it's snowing and you're, you know, you've got your eyewear on, your helmet, and maybe a headlamp. And there's just a lot, you know, last we had a night mission uh, in a rock quarry uh, about a month ago. And it's, it's hard to have a helmet, uh, headlamp, eyewear, mask. I mean, it's just a lot of stuff on. So um, it's, I, I understand that it's really difficult to uh, actually employ these techniques. Um, patient care, this is another hard thing to do because all of the, everybody on this call is a can-do person, right? We're there, we want to help, we're going to dive in, we're, and we know what to do because we're experts. And so um, try to designate one rescuer to approach the subject, everybody stand back and do a symptom check with the, um, with the subject, give them a mask and a, and, um, and glasses or you know some cheap uh, safety glasses whatever you've got and then try to limit the number of people exposed on the litter so uh, this is this is I want to just spend a minute talking about this because this comes up a lot so you're a litter attendant are you being exposed to somebody in, with uh, maybe has COVID you don't know and so this is this is a tough situation. So this the in in Oregon we have different rules than you have if you're in Utah or if you're in Montana or if you're in Colorado. So we all have different state rules. This is this is as you probably know this is one of the problems in the United States. Um, not so much um, elsewhere in North America, but we don't have a unified set of guidelines. So not everybody follows the CDC guidelines. So. In Oregon, if you're a medical person and you're wearing a mask and eyewear, even if and you're closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes, that would not be an exposure if you're a medical person. And because the, the risk, the uh, transmission in the medical field is very, very low. It's almost negligible because every medical field is following COVID precautions. 
But so if you are not a med, so th that rule might apply if you're like, for example, an EMS unit, or even if you're a non-transport EMS unit, which maybe some MRA teams, I know some are, uh, MRA teams are non-transport EMS units. But if you're not a medical person, the CDC defines an exposure as being closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes, which is, you know, almost every rescue if you're a litter attendant. And so a ma wearing a mask does not uh, eliminate that exposure uh, for the general public. And so we're, you know, as mountain rescuers, we're kind of in the middle. So I think the main reason I want to mention that is that, that, that you're, you are, at, it's very low risk to begin with to be outside. If you have the patient with a mask and you're wearing a mask and you've got the litter shield, it's very low risk, but nonetheless, it still is a potential exposure if you're less than six feet from the patient and for greater than 15 minutes, okay? So it's just something to be aware of. And if you're uncomfortable with that, you probably have to figure out how to mitigate that on, on missions. Um, I want to talk about CPR because this uh, hopefully doesn't come up very often for anybody, but I want to talk about how we handle CPR in, um, in, mission, in missions. And I was, unfortunately, I was in training in the 80s, late 80s, when HIV epidemic uh, was, you know, just exploding. And we dealt, we had to deal with this. It was a, it was a big issue. Do healthcare people or do general public walk by somebody who's in cardiac arrest? because they potentially have HIV, which at that time was deadly. So here are some options for CPR to be safe. One is, this is fully sanctioned by American Heart, which is the, where this graphic comes from, um, hands-only CPR. It's, it's, it's acceptable to do hands-only CPR. Generally, this guideline is not for people doing CPR at the side of a mountain, you know, three hour extrication. It's generally meant for people around the street that are waiting for EMS, but nonetheless, it's acceptable if you're, BL, if you're BLS trained to do hands-only CPR. Now, if you wanna do ventilation, the best option would be bag valve mask ventilation. So that's this right upper hand, uh, right upper corner here. This, this is the, uh, 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 a mask and you hook up the bag and you've seen it, you know, we squeeze the bag and it forces air into the lungs. I carry one in my advanced life support kit, but not, not all of you are gonna have it. You might have one in your truck or in your cache. Um, I, I carry the pediatric bag because it's small and I'm kind of a weight weenie and I want it the small as possible. And the pediatric bag is 500 cc's instead of 1,000, so it works just fine. So that's ideal. Now, if you, if you wanna do mouth ventilation directly with this, uh, you know, either have this mask or this, a lot of us, a lot of you might carry these little, um, pocket masks which are like rolled up the size of like a half of a golf ball and make sure it has a backflow valve and a viral filter not all of them do most of them have a backflow valve but um but you you, you want to get probably a newer one that has a viral filter a backflow valve and a viral filter um, a third option you know we're rescue mountaineers we're used to improvising we kind of have to think out of the box so this is something you can do option four you know if you if you have a subject who is in, you need to do CPR on, and there's a household member or a spouse or significant other, have them do mouth to mouth because they're probably already exposed. Um, is it okay just to not do CPR? And the answer is yes. <laughs> but you know, this would depend on your protocols. But um, <clears throat> this um, this list, I'm not going to go into detail, but um, Charlie mentioned uh, my participation in the International Commission for Alpine Rescue as an alternate delegate. Uh, the last ICAR we had, there's this really fabulous uh, talk uh, with a paper that's coming about how to teach non-medical mountain rescuers to determine that somebody's dead, because that's an important function that you all need to do at some point or may need to do, um, because you're, you, you know, you're not gonna be able to rely on a medical person, perhaps. So, so is it okay not to do CPR? Now these, these, this list, these are kind of obvious, uh, although liver mortis, which is a pooling of the blood can be mistaken for bruising, rigor mortis, which is when the body stiffens, can be mistaken for a frozen body. So even those are difficult, even for medical professionals. But here, here's a list I think it's worth just considering. So these are why you would not do CPR, right? Uh, obstructed airway, 
and a critical burial time of greater than 60 minutes in an avalanche victim. That's somebody who's dead. Unwitnessed cardiac arrest following blunt trauma. So we know that if your heart stops beating from trauma, the chance of you surviving is very, very low, especially if it's unwitnessed, meaning it happened, you know, minutes or hours before. Although every once in a while there's a save, which is this article I pasted down here at the bottom, which is actually from Mount Adams, which is a woman who fell in Mount Adams in, uh, in Washington state and had a traumatic cardiac arrest and survived. But they, her, her fall time to getting to the emergency department at Harborview level one trauma center was four hours. So very quickly by helicopter. But so I, I, remind, I, I put that in there to remind everybody that these are things you should consider, but you know, they're not, they're not um, the gold standard. So somebody who's submerged for 90 minutes, uh, quality CPR for 30 minutes. If you're doing CPR for 30 minutes and that person is not being revived and you're in the wilderness, it's okay to stop. In Europe, it would be 20 minutes. We had a mission on Mount Hood about uh, maybe three or four years ago that I, wa I was working so I couldn't um, go on the mission, but I watched it on the news. They, they had uh, a fallen climber and two um, bystanding bystander climbers did CPR for two hours, two hours of CPR while they waited for a helicopter, which then did a very dangerous extrication. So two hours of CPR is probably never indicated. Um, if somebody, if you come upon somebody who's doing CPR, that might be an indication to stop. That's hard to do, right? If there's, we had a rescue a couple years ago with a father who was hiking the Timberline Trail that goes around Mount Hood and his daughter showed up or his daughter was doing CPR on him and then the rescuers got there and they basically had to stop. And then the last one, infectious disease risk. So uh, I already talked about that. That might be an indication that you stop CPR. If you have to abandon precautions, COVID precautions, you may have to, and you just uh, have to deal with it. So here's a mission. This is a mission from Portland Mountain Rescue and the Craig Rats were uh, backup support, but this is a hypothermic, I think, snowboarder on the south side of Mount Hood, down deep uh, in, uh, on the zigzag. Um, and so they bivouacked here and kind of had to abandon COVID precautions. And so um, assistant medical, associate medical director, Pierce Beisinger and myself, Mostly Pierce called the, the patient regularly uh, for the 14 days following this mission to make sure he didn't have any signs and symptoms of COVID. And, uh, and, so, and so if it happens, make a note of it, re report it to uh, incident command and document it really well. Um, that's important. When you're done with your mission, you know, this is my colleague and friend, Ron Martin, and this is what we do when we're done with missions, right? We just run to get some food because we're so hungry. But remember to wash your hands and use hand sanitizer. You've been out in the field, you're trading carabiners and slings, and um, you're on the litter. I uh, hope you probably have gloves, but just wash your hands. And so I, I made this asterisk here, uh, but the hand sanitizer, we're, we're pretty sure hand sanitizer works just fine on COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, the disease, but not all viruses are killed by hand sanitizer. So for example, norovirus is encapsulated, it doesn't get killed by hand sanitizer. So it's better to wash your hands if you have that capability, which you, which you might not. Um, so clean everything. Uh, the, the one thing I wanna mention, um, you know, I got a call early on in the pandemic from the Forest Service. They were worried about their gloves. You know, people would come home from trail crew and the Forest Service, throw all their clothes in the wash, but then what do they do with their leather gloves? And this is probably overkill, but what I told them is issue everybody three pairs of gloves. You wear one glove, one pair on Monday. At the end of the day, you put those aside in a paper bag, wear a second pair of gloves on Tuesday, put those aside after Tuesday, wear the third pair on Wednesday. Then on Thursday, you start the cycle all over again. And that's what we were doing in the emergency department with N95 masks. We had three of them. We just, every three days, we, we went back to the uh, first mask. So that's probably overkill. Um, probably not necessary. One day is probably enough. Um, clean everything. Here's a, this is a pretty good link to um, comprehensive cleaning solutions if you need to clean your equipment. Like we wipe down everything if we've had a patient in the litter. 
um, and they're clothed and they don't have any respiratory symptoms and you know you can wipe down things quickly and put it out of service for one day and that's probably fine but if you really need to disinfect something you know make sure you use a proper solution if that's bleach and water or uh, commercial oxyclean or whatever you know your team uses um, and then you know wash you, you everybody probably knows how to wash their other gear um, helicopters this is a kind of a funny thing I find helicopters it, our helicopter uh, service, which is um, the uh, Army Guard out of Salem, Oregon, they, there have been on a couple of missions where they haven't wanted to help us with a non-critical um, extrication because they didn't want to take their helicopter out of service for 72 hours, which I find unbelievably crazy because you, you, you can clean a helicopter and it doesn't have to wait for 72 hours to be disinfected by air. Our operating rooms in our hospital in Hood River we take them after a surgery, we take them out of service for an hour and a half, and then they're back in service again. That's the time it takes to cycle the air through the um, operating room. So anyway, so this is an issue though, at least in our region, and so I'd be interested to know if other people are having the same issue with um, particularly military aircraft, if they're having this problem. Um, some training considerations, I know that this causes a fair bit of anxiety and, um, and angst, at least it does among me and my, uh, the leaders of my teams, um, you know, we, we need to train. I'm, I'm really glad that um, the MRA and Charlie and, and Doug and you guys are doing these lecture series because we have to train. We have to maintain operational readiness. We have to maintain our, you know, uh, esprit de corps, our collegial interactions. It's really important. So, my, I'm really an advocate of continuing to train and, can train and training in person if it's safe. And so here's the list that I came up with. Um, uh, of course, you can review your state guidelines. As a general rule, I use the state guidelines that pertain to civic groups, but we are, as mountain rescuers, beyond a civic group because we are a, we are, might be a nonprofit or a club, but we provide an essential emergency service. So that's a good place to start. Um, if you can, if you can do some prep work, virtual, and then minimize your outdoor time, and just you know, you kind of have to think about every aspect of training. Limiting your group size to the venue, make sure you have enough instructors to participants. Uh, you might want to limit to active first responders. You really might want to strongly encourage high-risk groups uh, to self-select and opt out. You know, um, if you have members in high-risk categories. And then, of course, no food or alcohol consumption because you don't want to take off your mask. And, um, and so those are some training considerations, which I think are. Um, so a couple more slides. So have I been exposed? That's a big question, right? Have you been exposed? So uh, you're carrying the litter near the subject's head. We already talked about this. If, if there's no COVID positive people, uh, rescuers or subjects, and nobody's symptomatic, that's not an exposure. If after the rescue, somebody calls and says, I, I'm positive, I'm a rescuer, I was on the mission, or uh, the subject is, for whatever reason, turns up positive, that, the, the answer to that question is maybe. <laughs> so you might be exposed. So this is when you need to go to your uh, sheriff department or your, you know, your team and figure out how to um, address it and probably go straight to get to your doctor uh, your primary care doctor to address it because every situation is different. There's nothing's cut and dry. It depends on you know how long you're at the lid on the litter, or where if, you, or if you're wearing a mask, or you at the foot of the litter, or you at the head of the litter. I mean, there's just so many factors that pertain to it, but it's possible. If somebody not on the rescue, this comes up almost daily. If somebody not on the rescue, or sorry, if somebody on the rescue, like a rescuer, has somebody at home, like a family member who turns up positive, does that mean everybody on the mission is exposed? And the answer is no, there's no third party transmission. We don't count that right now. Um, and so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So if, you're, if you find out after the mission that a rescuer's spouse or significant other is positive, that doesn't mean you're exposed as long as the rescuer isn't positive. Okay, how do you get a test? I'm a big advocate for trying to get the test through your regular doctor because that person has kind of a global picture of your health. Um, you may have an occupational medicine process in your team. And so that brings me to this question. Can you, if you're exposed on a mission, 
uh, or potentially exposed, can you file a work comp claims? In my experience, I do a fair bit of work comp. In my experience in Washington, Oregon, and California, most work comp insurers will pay for you to be evaluated and get a test. And then if you're negative, you won't have a claim. And if you're positive, they probably will deny your claim because it's really tough. This is happening all over in health, not all over, but it's happening frequently in healthcare. It's uh, where hospital workers turn positive and they want to file a work comp claim. And it's oftentimes denied because it's just so hard to determine where you got exposed. But nonetheless, report it if you feel like you need to, um, because that's important. Um, okay, I think I have two more slides. Um, I want to talk just briefly about testing because this is this is not particular to mountain rescue um, except um, of the new home kit, which may be something that teams might want to use. So there's a lot of confusion about tests. So we have two types of tests uh, for acute infection. One is a molecular test, which detects D, D, um, RNA, genetic material. So that's also called um, a nucleic acid amplification test, which is a fancy word for basically detecting the genetic material of the virus. And that test comes in three different versions. And I'm really trying to get people not to use the word rapid test because there's three different types of rapid tests. There's the molecular test, the antigen test, and the antibody test. And so rapid test is not a great way to, not a great term to use. So the molecular tests the gold standard is the one that's done in the lab. That's the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, which is a very fancy word for a D, an RNA test that's done in the lab. There's the rapid point of care test, which is this unit right here. This is the um, Abbott ID. So this is done in about 15 to 20 minutes, and it's it's this machine costs I don't know five or six grand, and you you know you this is be like something that your doctor's office would have. And then there's the new. Uh, this is the home kit which is, uh, I think, just got approved by the FDA, so we'll be seeing this um, more and more. So this is a fairly accurate molecular home kit that you can buy um, or will be able to buy. Um, there's another type of test, and that's the antigen test. And this is, this is being distributed widely by FEMA. There are a lot of... Um, there, there are a lot of uh, every oh, there's a lot of people are getting them. I mean, in, in small Hood River County, we got 3,000 of these from FEMA. So this is an this detects viral proteins. It's um, very accurate at detecting somebody who's positive, almost the same as the molecular test. It's not very. It's uh, um, and so it's it's if you get if you get get a positive, it's probably a true positive. If you it's not so great at detecting a true negative. So if you get a negative. You know, you have to weigh your risks on if you need another one. Here's the test right here. It's called this, the one that's that's being uh, distributed by FEMA. It's called the Binax. Now, it's very easy to operate. It's like doing a pregnancy test or a, or a strep throat, quick strep, or it's very easy. So, so that's a point of care test. These tests, we're not using. The one reason I want to mention them, we're not using the antibody test or the stool test or the viral culture. The reason I want to mention them is when people speak of rapid tests, there is a rapid test for the antibody. So that detects somebody who has already been exposed to um, COVID and already had the illness uh, or been exposed and has created an immune response. Okay, so this is the this is uh, the window of infectivity. So uh, so. From the time you're exposed, if you're on a mission and you're exposed here at day minus five, or we'll call it day one, if you're exposed here, you're really not going to show symptoms for roughly four to five, four to six days. And four to six days is the best window to detect somebody who has coronavirus. So many of you, if you've gotten a coronavirus test because you had an exposure, you you may have had this experience where you were told we're not going to test you now, come back in three days. And that's um, because it's more accurate to test in um, at day four to six, or if you're some federal agencies are basically testing twice. So you had an exposure, they test at the time you got exposed and then they test again in a week. So, so that's, um, that's a important thing to keep in mind. And then once you have the onset of symptoms or confirmation that you've been effective with a positive test. We haven't been able to detect um, 
active live virus beyond nine days. So the fact that somebody is exposed or has turned positive that is um, quarantining for 14 days, that's an extra measure of safety. But nine, nine to 10 days is probably the window. Um, okay, so la this is my last slide, I believe. So vaccine is coming. There's six vaccines in stage three. Um, I, heard, I was on a call earlier, uh, let's say yesterday from uh, FEMA. It sounds like Pfizer and Moderna, Moderna vaccines are probably gonna be approved at the end of this month. And there's probably gonna be 50 million um, vaccines uh, doses by the end of the month. Um, and the governors are gonna be in charge of allocating initial vaccines. So that would be healthcare workers, that would be first responders, which may very well include um, Mount, rescue mountaineers. So we, we may, you may have access to the vaccine sooner or you may not, I'm not sure yet. So, um, okay, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, um, to uh, give that talk. I know it was fast. I'm happy to uh, take any questions. We've got a few minutes left, I think. And again, thanks very much, Charlie. Hey, Christopher, thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to have you. And that was a great presentation. Uh, we do have a number of questions that I've uh, I've pulled up off the chat. We'll try to catch up with any others that uh, uh, that come in since I start this conversation. And bear with me, Christopher. You might have already answered one of these because I was trying to copy those and also uh, help us work through our limited um, 100 participants when we bought a 500 license. Um, so just to comment to, to the 30 or so people that joined us in the middle of Dr. Van Tilburg's presentation, my plan will be, because we're recording this live, that what we'll do when we say goodnight to you all is we'll shut down and that, down, that, that recording uh, won't download to my computer until we end the meeting. And it'll, because it's an hour long presentation, it'll probably take a good 10 minutes for it to hit my computer. But then what I'll do is I'll reopen uh, this, um, this same Zoom account. So just link, you'll sit in a waiting room. If you wanna watch this tonight, I will replay the video recording. I think that's gonna work, it should work. There may only be a dozen of you, but we owe it to you to make sure you can see the recording tonight. We will also edit it and we'll post it uh, on the MRA webs, uh, I'm sorry, through the MRA admin lister. So you'll have a link to a private YouTube uh, so you can watch it. Somebody asked if we could get the PowerPoint and Dr. Van Tilburg, I presume you agree. I'd rather we don't send a PowerPoint by itself because really the heart and soul of this presentation was the words that Dr. Van Tilburg presented to us and it would really be hard to infer what uh, we were taught tonight through that presentation. But we will send the link to the recording. I'm gonna finish with one last thought and then I'm gonna run through the Q&A that we add. And we'll, we might go a couple of minutes past the top of the hour, but I think you'll all have patience with us. Um, my first comment is be cautious. Just in the last 24 hours, I learned that my only two brothers are both COVID positive. Um, we have a daughter who's a paramedic and there's um, some infections even within her own program, her, her uh, EMS program. I think this, uh, that what used to be a, oh my God, it's in my community became, oh my God, it's in my neighborhood. And now it's, oh my God, it's amongst our friends. So let's all be cautious which uh, reinforces why Dr. Van Tilburg's presentation was so timely. I'm just gonna rip, th rip through some of the Q&A comments. Again, David Hale, thank you for asking whether you can get a copy of the video to share on Facebook. We will post a, a private YouTube. Um, Keith Conover, a longtime friend, uh, asks many of you, check the chat if you will. He sent a link to an Appalachian Search and Rescue Conference report for just-in-time training. I want you guys to take a look at that. Um, Steve Petty from Petzl. We're gonna cut back to Steve in a minute or to Don Wilson in a minute, but uh, Petzl has recommendations for cleaning equipment and that is posted also in the chat. My daughter who's the co-host tonight is gonna save the entire chat to a text file so you'll be able to look at it if you don't see it. Um, uh, let's see what else is there. Um, Curtis Bartlett asked uh, Dr. Uh, Van Tilburg, is the molecular home kit a one-time use or multiple? That's from Curtis uh, from Adelaide. Do you wanna jump on that? Do you know? Yeah, so, and I see there's also a second question about how accurate it is. Uh, the, the 
a molecular test is going to be a one-time use, so you're going to have to buy a slew of them. And so once it's processed, you throw it away. Uh, how accurate is it? The accuracy, we're not really sure yet. It's If it's done properly, it's uh, a positive test is going to be fairly accurate. I'm not sure what the number is, um, o- over 80%. But a negative is going to be less accurate. The, the problem with the home test is going to be acquiring a – nasal swab properly because it's a little hard to do it's a little painful if any of you have had a COVID test even the anterior nasal swab done properly doesn't feel very good so the accuracy will be diminished if the collect that's the big a big key is the collection of the specimen um so all right and i've got a few more off of the earlier chat while you were presenting christopher but uh if you want to look at the tail end, it looks like there's four or five that you could answer in a moment, but let me just um, pass on a couple of just comments and, and answer or questions. Um, first off, from my perspective, serving on the board of the International Commission for Alpine Rescue as president of the Air Rescue Commission, we just had our Congress about, what, a month ago, um, and the good news I have is that um, worldwide, we are not aware of very many at all uh, rescue mountaineer infections of COVID due to SAR response or for that matter, even SAR trainings. Um, And I'm only starting now to hear about uh, infections at EMS bases in the United States, as I mentioned, the one with my daughter in in the Salt Lake City area. Um, But we've done a good job and we've, we've followed some of what Dr. Van Tilburg already Um, already taught us. We've also done some studies here at Flight for Life and others have been done worldwide on the impact on O2 saturation for uh, air rescue crew members while especially pilots who we want to be on top of their game uh, while flying and yet wearing masks and there are now some special uh, masks for uh, flight helmets that include microphones and O2 uh, supply so anyone has any questions, shoot me an email. You'll find my email link on the MRA website. Um, And uh, Christopher, there was one question that was asked to me by text from a colleague just asking about decontamination of trucks, equipments, helicopter insides between uh, operations. Certainly with rescue trucks that may be parked in a bay for a day, maybe that's not an issue, but with a helicopter that might turn regularly, and forgive me again if you... uh, if you already addressed this, then I'll let you take the Q&A that's already in the chat. Uh, I, I guess for sur- hard surfaces, I would wipe them down with either an, uh, an oxy wipe or a, any antibacterial wipe or spray with a cloth, um, whatever your team has available. So that means, you know, you kind of have to think through everything you touch. So if it's a vehicle, wipe down the steering wheel and the outside handle and the indoor handles. Uh, in practice, if you let the tr- if you let the truck sit for a day, it's gonna no COVID is gonna likely live on the surface. So that's the other option is just you know take it out of service for a day. But if you have a back to back rescue, uh, wipe everything down. I mean the fail safe against that again is washing your hands, not touching your face, and wearing a mask. So even if you do get coronavirus on your hands from a steering wheel, you're not gonna inoculate yourself. So you can get coronavirus on your hands and not get the disease if you can wash it off your hands. So, um, and so that's, it's cleaning the trucks hard to do. I mean, we get done with a mission and it's, you know, two in the morning, we just want to go home and go to bed. So that's, that's tough. Um, There's a question about uh, wet masks. So that's a great question. I should add that in the next time I give a talk like this, the surgical masks are not designed to use when they're wet. So they don't work. Um, The N95s are also not designed. um, And so if you can find, so the, the N, is sort of the medical designation for the 95 mask. So if you can find an R95, which is resistant to oil, which has some um, water protectivity, or a P95, which is impermeable to oil, uh, offer a better water resistance. And so that's probably what I would do. There's a, there's a fair bit of R95 masks available uh, because hardware stores carry them and there's, there's less um, P95s and P100s, but uh, the N95 is gonna work okay when it's wet not not great but it's still going to retain its shape so if you're in wet conditions bring a couple of masks you know bring 
three cloth masks and have some backups. Um, hey, Christopher, can you define wet? Because if I'm like, you know, breathing super hard in a dry climate like Colorado, um, is just my uh, exhaust going to be enough to wet a mask or do you mean soaking wet? I mean, soaking wet, like from rain or weather. Yeah, your, yeah, okay. your breath, the N95s are designed to wear for a long duration without getting wet from perspiration. They're still going to function from ex, uh, expired breath. Sure, um, sure. So um, let's see, there's a question about the an antibiotics in the vaccine or the antibodies in the vaccine. The answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows how long natural antibodies last if you've had COVID. Nobody knows how long the vaccines work all but one vaccine in the six that are in stage three trials are are a, a primary and a booster so two shots and they all vary if they're one month apart or two months apart but we don't know how long they're going to last i mean like when the chicken pox vaccine came out we thought everybody just needed one shot and then years went by and we were we realized not every you know the immunity waned and everybody needed a booster of the chicken pox shot so it, it may be the same it may be we need repeated boosters of the covid and maybe we need there's a different strain um every year so um so uh the fluid shield masks are um yeah a, a great idea but as the um, as Keith uh, Conover mentioned in his, uh, you can read his uh, chat message that um, uh, it's it's tough to it's tough to operate with them. Like I said, I, I I was on a mission with you know COVID stuff and a helmet and a headlamp and it's and you know radio in my chest harness with the antenna sticking up in my face. It's it's a lot of stuff going on. It's it's difficult. I sympathize with with everybody. So. Uh, I, it looks like we've made it through most of the chat questions and uh, Dr. Van Tilburg, I really appreciate you. Um, the timing of your presentation couldn't be better um, and your experience and expertise speaks for itself. And so we're privileged to have you not just in this role tonight, but as the MRA uh, Medcom uh, committee chair and as the and ICAR delegate to the medical committee uh, for the International Commission. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, many of you joined late. We're terribly sorry that what we thought was a Zoom account with 100 participants, I'm sorry, with 500 was in fact a Zoom account with only 100. We were able to remedy that, but it was about two thirds of the way through Dr. Van Tilburg's presentation. For those of you that joined late, my expectation is that I'm going to, we're gonna shut down this in just a couple of minutes after we give uh, Don Wilson a chance to give away um, a uh, Petzl Maestro. And then when we shut down, if uh, anyone's interested that uh, join late, uh, come back in the, at the bottom of the hour. Uh, that would be 7.30 Pacific, uh, 8.30 Mountain Time, and the rest of you uh, east of us can figure that out. What I'm, uh, we're recording this presentation. That should give Zoom enough time to download the presentation to my computer. And what I will do is then uh, bring you back in and I will just run the recording again at the bottom of the hour. Thank you for your patience. It's gonna be a long night for those of you, but rest assured that next month we'll have that problem solved. Um, Don Wilson, I think you're online. And again, thanks to Steve Petty from Petzl for providing product uh, to be given away. And uh, Dawn, if you wanna jump in, we wanna thank Dawn. She is the head of the MRA's um, uh, sponsorship program, which is so valuable to us. Um, and so Dawn, if you'll jump in, I'll close out when you're all finished and thanks everybody. Yeah, and I love how you keep saying, I'm giving something away. I just happened to announce the winner. It's really Steve Petty and Petzl. So thank you to them for offering this. Steve's holding it up. -da 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 -da. Okay, so if I say your name, get your finger ready to put your video and your mute button undone so we know that you're actually listening and you're there and not just putting your screen on for us tonight. I have our goddess, R-G-A-T-T-A-S, your team. If you can jump on and show your video and your unmuted button, uh, Petzl will send you the maestro. So our goddess, R-G-A-T-T-A-S, you just disappeared. Where are you? Am I here? Yeah, woo! Oh, yay! There oh, you go. Oh. 
Woo-hoo! So, Bob, what, 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 tell everybody about your team and what you guys are going to do with this equipment. Uh, we're with West Valley Search and Rescue out of San Bernardino County, and uh, we'll use it on the mountain <laughs> and train with it and put it to good use. Congratulations, and thanks, Steve and Nicole over at Petzl for offering the Maestro tonight. That's all I got for you guys. And I'll try to get you a sponsor every single month. So uh, make sure you guys support our sponsors on our social media, uh, through our pro deals, and when you're just out there recreating and doing search and rescue. And I got to share, Dawn and I are both on Alpine Rescue Team, and Dawn um, is, as I mentioned, taking over the sponsorship program for MRA. Um, she goes to the outdoor retailer trade show and probably walks 15 miles in a given day talking to the various uh, supporters of MRA and is just a freaking rock star. So Don, thanks for that. We do intend to have giveaways with every month. Uh, thanks to all of you who, uh, who stuck with us. Um, I will just really quickly share screen on um, one reminder of the uh, remaining programs uh, that you are going to be able to uh, experience in the next few months. You'll see in December 17th, hypothermia and associated, mal associated maladies out of the University of San Diego. Sartopo is on January 21. Uh, spring and summer avalanches with Dale Atkins on February 18th. And uh, we've got programs already lined up for March and April. So just want to say thanks to everybody. With that, I'm going to shut down the... Uh, the presentation and we will um, see you in a month. Blessings, stay safe y'all. Great, thank you Charlie, thank you Christopher, great job tonight and uh, apologies for the uh, technical difficulty on, on our side. Thanks Doug McCall, MRA president, you rock man, thanks.